Kevin, are we live? Yes, we are. Okay. Hello. Uh, welcome to the Platypus Affiliated Society public forum panel discussion on the Democratic Party and the left. Uh, please welcome our guests. And this is the order in which they will speak. Harvey Kay, Reed Cotless, Wayne Price, and Gerald Smith. Um, Harvey Kay is a professor emeritus of democracy and justice studies at the University of Wisconsin Green Bay and a contributor to Jacobin Magazine's YouTube channel. Uh, Reed Cotless is a member of the Platypus Affiliated Society and, and also has his project called Socialist Legacy. Wayne Price is a revolutionary anarchist. And Gerald Smith is a member of the Oscar Grant Committee, Berkeley Cop Watch, and he's a former member of the Black Panther Party. I'm Chris Catrone, and I will be moderating the discussion today uh, on behalf of Platypus. Um, and we're posing the question to the panelists, what was the historical relationship between the left and the Democratic Party? And what can that tell us about the problems and tasks we inherit from the 1920s and 30s old left, the 1960s and 70s new left, and even earlier history? Okay, so please, uh, Harvey, could you start us off? Yeah, well, let me just start off by saying, or just to clarify things. The first one is, is that the term the left is, is, is pretty vague, okay? And, uh, but I'm going to allow for the fact that in the course of all these years of the 20th century, well, especially say post 1920s, that the left really en encompassed, and I'll start on the more moderate end of the scale, sort of what has sometimes been called fighting liberals, radicals, generically progressives, socialists, communists, and, and others, okay? I mean, that's, I, okay. And the very fact that I've only, lim that I've limited myself to those references al already makes clear that in spite of the fact I haven't gone on to the various parties, that um, the left was fragmented. And it's always been the case on the left, unfortunately, okay, period. But what was interesting about the 30s, okay, A, worst economic and social catastrophe in American history, okay? B, Americans elected a president and a party with the greatest hold on government that, um, that the Democrats, Roosevelt's party, had, had ever seen. And by way of, of an election in 32, and then all the more in 36, by votes that were unprecedented, okay? Now, here's the thing. Um, Franklin Roosevelt was undeniably a central figure in the Democratic Party. He had come up through the New York State uh, Senate to the, um, to the Wilson administration in the 20s. He would have been a very, very prominent figure in the party had he not endured uh, polio. He had already run for vice president in 1920. And the amazing thing about it, and this is not to go on about Roosevelt, is that in spite of the polio, in spite of the fact that after he suffered the polio and suffered his entire life, he would never be able to stand on his own. He would always have to be sort of sustained as he was walking by terrible braces and by someone on his arm and also by holding on to the podium. But the interesting thing is he rose to become probably the most vibrant figure in politics in the 20s and in the late 20s. And then of course, to my mind, the greatest president of the 20th century. And he did so because he, he, he was, for lack of a better word, a really transformative figure. He had begun as a sort of moderate progressive in the Democratic Party um, in his younger years. And he became in the course of the 20s, far more than a progressive. He called himself a liberal, but he really did radically redefine the term liberal. And anyone, if you ever talk to people about liberalism, you'll know that they're going to ask you, what do you mean classical 18th century liberalism or the modern version of it? So the fact that he radically transformed liberalism is the fact that he really made American liberalism the closest thing to social democracy that the United States um, had known as a major political force at the center. The socialists, obviously, earlier in the century, and I think Reed is going to speak to that. Um, 
called themselves originally social democrats. Even the anarchists of the 19th century called themselves social democrats. Roosevelt never called himself a social democrat, but he was indeed a social democrat. Um, so anyhow, to continue, the point is that when Roosevelt ran for president in 32, he ran on what was at that moment a decidedly progressive and social democratic tick, uh, a platform. He called for what he called old, it was old age pensions, but, but what he meant was social security. He called for addressing the environment in a massive way. He had already begun to do that in New York State. He talked about the rights of workers. Um, he talked about major public works in order to provide power and electricity to farms and homes that previously did not have them. And in the course of his presidency, and it's interesting, in the course of his presidency, he, he actually garnered the support, even at the outset, but all the way through of the American labor movement. And I know that uh, we can talk about that relationship further in the future. But in spite of the fact that this was a man who had come up from a Hudson River gentry family, an a sort of, if you like, Northeastern aristocracy, he really was committed to small d democracy. And that included the rights of workers, which he learned not only when he was Assistant Secretary of the Navy, but actually learned all the more during the 1920s when he was sort of, you know, suffering the worst debilitation of the polio. And, and Eleanor Roosevelt was involved in the trade, Women's Trade Union League. It would bring home socialist organizers, socialist textile organizers, women textile organizers, who educated FDR as to, the, as to what the life of working class poor and working class people in New York City was all about. So Roosevelt had ambitions. He was determined he was going to create economic security. And he set out in the New Deal, not, I mean, historians like to say that he rescued capitalism and undeniably to, to a great extent he did, but he actually rescued democracy because in 1932, the assumption was on the part of the elites that America might actually need to go fascist. That in fact, Vanity Fair magazine, the president of the American Political Science Association and others actually talked about the possibility of a, of a fascist leader. Mussolini was the figure they had in mind in particular. But Roosevelt was act, actually committed to small d democracy. And he, he ends up offering and affording a presidency, and I won't go through every year because it changes dramatically, but by the mid 1930s, it's fairly apparent that this is a presidency that is going to be in American 20th century terms, essentially revolutionary, okay? Think about this, I, I, think about this. In the course of that, decade, a president and a people, and they had a very dialectical relationship, which I can get into if anybody wants to know, they, subje they subjected big business to public account and regulation, empowered the federal government to address the needs of working people, mobilized and organized labor unions, fought for their rights, broadened and leveled the we and we the people. They actually transformed people's understandings radically of the role of government in American life established a social security system, expanded the nation's public infrastructure in truly dramatic ways, improved the environment, cultivated the arts and refashioned popular culture, and actually imbued themselves with fresh democratic convictions, hopes, and aspirations. Now, the thing is that, that he, he, he really did control Congress. He did not, however, control the Supreme Court. He was stymied at various times by the court and then had the good fortune eventually of having people die on the court and create, could create his own court. But in the course of the 1930s, millions of workers, uh, I won't detail the difference between the AFL and the new CIO, but millions of workers, not only millions of white workers, millions of workers in all their diversity entered into labor unions. The CIO was committed to multiracial unionism. The AFL was, was a laggard in those terms. The main thing is, is this, where was the left on these questions? Well. There's something that people rarely hear about. I'm talking as if I'm talking to a general audience and not necessarily informed people on the left, but it's really significant to, to recognize the degree to which that, that FDR actually encouraged the formation of what was known as a popular front. A popular front that was a broad left force that included those very folks I referred to before, socialists, fighting liberals, radicals, uh, folks who call themselves progressives and communists. And this was, this was organized in particular in the course of the 1935 and 36 and 37 years. And what this popular front did, because they didn't, in part, they, yes, they helped 
Roosevelt win a massive election victory in 1936. But the other thing they did is they actually worked by way of their cultural activities and organizing activities to transform Americans' understanding of themselves and to fashion a new American narrative. And this was, there was much left undone. And I, I actually meant to start at the beginning that clearly, clearly Jim Crow survived the 1930s. Clearly at the outset of the war, the, war, the, the army became a Jim Crow military. It's also the case that Roosevelt failed to get Congress, okay, which was filled with white supremacists and anti-Semites, failed to get them to lift the immigration quota to allow in uh, greater numbers of European, especially Jewish refugees. Moreover, one of the worst civil, right, civil liberties uh, decisions was carried forth, and that was the internment of Japanese Americans, okay? That we recognize, but it is also the case that in the course of the 1930s that America was by its, by the comparison to the late 19th century Gilded Age, which lasted all the way through to the late 1920s, the American political order and economic order was radically transformed. Not as much as those of us who are socialists would have definitely preferred, but it did provide for a massive labor union movement. And it also meant that when the term big labor was used in the course of the 40s and 50s, it meant something. And I'll leave the Cold War question to another moment, but I, I think it's significant. And I think we really do. I don't know, I'm gonna stop here because I, I could go on and on and on. It is the case that the 1930s was probably one of the three great revolutionary moments in American history. The American Revolution, the Civil War, and the 1930s New Deal era and the formation of a generation that continued the ideals of the New Deal and the labor movement well into the 1970s when war was declared, a class war was declared on the part of capital and finance against working people. Thank you. Um, just to remind, I think uh, everyone should try to keep their uh, opening remarks to less than 15 minutes. Um, Harvey, you came in just in time. Uh, Reed, you're up next. Thank you. Um, so, well, before I begin, let me just say, um, I'm going to be generalizing a bit about the position of the Socialist Party of America during the Debs era um, from 1900 to 1920, roughly. Um, and this party is often characterized as heterogeneous and lacking a kind of unifying ideological um, identity um, and being more of a kind of grab bag of different socialist tendencies. Um, which is a characterization I would push back against quite strongly. I mean, there were certainly quite a lot of differences within the party, but there was a clear um, stated and affirmed uh, position outlined in the party's constitution, its platforms, its uh, resolutions at various conventions and propagated by its um, orators and newspapers and candidates for office. Um, so while there is a degree of variation, the generalizations I'm making in this presentation are drawn from what I would consider to be the kind of authoritative, unifying ideological um, documents of the parties, at least it's, it's formative period in the Debs era. Um, so I think pretty much almost anyone in the party would have affirmed what I'm going to be um, presenting here in this period. Certainly any um, member of any official standing or any candidate for office um, in, a, in a prominent position, maybe outside of Milwaukee, but that's an, another story. <clears throat> okay, so in 1900, during his first campaign for president on behalf of the newly formed Social Democratic Party of America, Eugene Debs had to fend off a rumor that he intended to drop out of the race before the election and support the Democratic Party candidate, William Jennings Bryan. He clarified that this was absolutely false, a pure fabrication of the capitalistic press, explaining that as a socialist candidate, 
I am equally opposed to all capitalistic parties of whatever name. The Democratic Party, like the Republican Party, stands for the capitalistic system and wage slavery, and I am uncompromisingly opposed to both. I am in the fight to the finish. His brother and fellow party member Theodore Debs commented that letters and telegrams have been pouring into headquarters, announcing the fact that the boys are highly amused at this old campaign trick. The Social Democratic Party, later renamed the Socialist Party of America, was from the outset unambiguous in its attitude toward the Democratic Party, which could be neatly summarized by the phrase intransigent opposition. According to the socialists, there was only one issue of political significance, the Industrial Revolution. The introduction of machinery into the production process meant that it was increasingly impossible to earn a living as an independent, self-employed artisan or farmer owing, owning the means of one's own labor. Small-scale production by individuals was being rapidly replaced by large-scale cooperative labor, employing immense machine systems. The socialists understood this revolution as potentially the means of emancipating all of humanity from the burden of labor and from social relations that compelled individuals to perform it. But the machines remained the exclusive property of a minority of individuals, the capitalist class, on whom the majority, owning no means of employing themselves, were dependent. The capitalist class naturally used their privileged position in the production process to preserve themselves in that position, and the workers, so long as they sought only to maintain themselves within the prevailing social relations, actively re reproduced the wealth of the capitalists and their own position of dependent subservience. The socialists recognized that if the workers united in common cause, they could lay claim to the machinery on which they depended and direct its use and development in their own interests, reducing the burden of labor and increasing the wealth and free time of every individual. Despite their differences, the Democratic and Republican parties were in essential agreement on this question. They alike stood for the preservation and perpetuation of the private ownership of the means of employment, and hence for the enslavement of the working class to the capitalist class. Where they differed, it was because the Republicans represented the capitalist class proper, the large capitalists, whereas the Democrats represented the middle, pardon me, middle class, the small property owners who were overwhelmingly being driven to ruin as competition between many small producers was increasingly supplanted by enormous monopolistic trusts dominating entire industries. The socialists understood this concentration and centralization of capital as the necessary and inevitable consequence of the advance of industry the development of productive forces in Marx's phrase. The ultimate result of this process could only be the unification of all capital into a single accumulation owned by society as a whole. Yet while this was the necessary and inevitable outcome, society itself continuously threw up obstacles to it. The Democrats sought to undo this process the Republicans to arrest it. Both represented the desire of the capitalists to retain capital as their private wealth, and hence to retain their privileged status as masters of the means of labor, and hence of the laborers. Yet it was not only the capitalists, large and small, who wanted to preserve the existing social order. The workers seeking to live within this society participated in its reproduction, and not only economically, but also politically, voting for one or the other capitalist party and believing in what they espoused and promised. Hence, it was not enough to wait for the inevitable outcome to arrive. 
the ultimate state that had to be arrived at was one in which the workers of the world would actively take their destiny into their own hands. So long as they resisted doing so and accepted their dependency and subservience, they would delay the inevitable. The socialists sought to educate the working class as to its historical destiny and aid them in organizing to this end, to take political power and use it to complete the expropriation of private property by transforming it into social wealth under their collective control. By contrast, the Democrats sought to break up the trusts and resurrect a society of self-employed small proprietors. The Republicans, by contrast, accepted the inevitability of the trusts and promised instead to regulate and restrain them and to thereby curb their negative impact upon the rest of society. American socialists did not regard the Democratic Party as part of or even proximate to the left, that is, the politics of universal emancipation that the socialists had inherited from the bourgeois revolutionary epoch. Of the two capitalist parties, they considered the Democratic Party to be clearly reactionary, seeking not to advance the revolutionary transformation of society, but to restore outmoded and obsolete forms of life. The socialists often analogized themselves to the Republican Party of Lincoln, which they regarded as playing a revolutionary role in pursuing the ult and ultimately accomplishing the abolition of chattel slavery. Yet the Republican Party had abandoned its revolutionary role before the task was complete. Chattel slavery was abolished only to be replaced by wage slavery the slavery of proletarianized workers who did not own the means of labor uh, to the capitalist class who monopolized the means of labor. Hence, the Republican Party had come to play a conservative role, seeking to indefinitely perpetuate a passing moment in the process of historical change. Nonetheless, the Socialist Party cared not which capitalist party was in power and did not support either. It was principally opposed to all fusion tactics, whether with one of the capitalist parties or with reformist third parties, going so far as to remove the party's first executive secretary, Leon Greenbaum, for encouraging the Socialist Party of California to share electoral tickets with the Union Labor Party in 1902. Socialists saw it as their duty to vote for their party. This was not a question of ideological or moralistic purism. It was an instrumental necessity. The larger the vote for the Socialist Party, the more people would become curious as to their appeal. A large vote would show a great growth and thus encourage others who are timid, in the words of Julius Wayland. It would expose more people to the party's perspective and goal and thereby open the opportunity of winning them over and organizing them to work for the socialist cause. The smaller the vote, the less significant and visible the socialist party would be on the national stage. Hence, socialism would remain largely unknown or otherwise what was known of it would come from its enemies, from the capitalist parties. Every delay of the necessary task of building up the party would prolong injustice and fasten tighter the bonds of industrial slavery. Hence, socialists had to do their duty by supporting their party at the polls. Socialists thought that if they grew large enough, it would force the two capitalist parties to unite in opposition to them clarifying the essential political conflict that was concealed by the apparent opposition of the really united capitalist parties. The real issue was capitalism versus socialism, which is to say the rule of the capitalist class versus the rule of the working class. They did not worry about the negative effects of one or the other party coming to power, much less the effect of spoiling the election for one or the other. Um, but nor did they trust the promises either party made, not so much because they doubted the sincerity of the politicians who made the promises, but because the politicians of both capitalist parties 
could not understand the nature of the social problems they had promised to redress, and hence would find themselves unable to do anything meaningful to either resolve or even ameliorate them. Um, Morris Hillquit, who was one of the leading members of the party, said, um, said the importance of the Socialist Party in American politics must be measured. Its present strength counts for little. Its ability to build for the future is of tremendous historical significance. But more important than our membership and our, and our vote is the preservation of the integrity, the soul of the party as an effective instrument for the coming social reconstruction. It is vital and indispensable for the ultimate triumph of our great cause that our party be preserved as a socialist party in the true meaning of the term. This above all meant standing for the independent political organization of the working class as the necessary means to conquer political power and thereby undertake the transformation of capital from private to social property. Of course, the Socialist Party ultimately faltered in the course of the crisis of World War I, as did its European counterparts, and never really recovered, although even to even begin to explain why is far beyond the scope of this presentation. Nonetheless, it is certainly worth observing the severe repression the party faced during the war at the hands of the progressive Democrat, Woodrow Wilson, who was president, for whom Hillquit had estimated that one half of the normal supporters of the Socialist Party voted due to his ultimately broken promise to keep the US out of the war, and which Hillquit believed enabled Wilson to secure the Democratic nomination against his primary opponent. I want to close with a quote from W.R. Snow, who was the State Secretary of the Illinois Socialist Party reflecting the desperation into which, um, reflecting on the desperation into which the collapse of the party drove some of its remaining members in the 20s. In this case, not into the arms of the Democratic Party itself, but into the project of building a broader labor party by uniting with <laughs> progressive middle-class elements and non-socialist labor unionists. He said, we can make a real labor party out of the socialist party within the next 15 or 20 years, or we can, like the children of Israel, wander in the wilderness for the next 40. Some of our eminent socialists seem to be headed for the jungle. Shall we sidetrack the real thing for the counterfeit? Political parties do not grow up get bald headed and lose their teeth quite as soon as we do as individuals. A political party that is only 21 years old is scarcely in the teething stage. The Democratic Party has long since passed the century mark, is able to hobble around without crutches and can even dance political jazz and flirt with the flappers. The Republican Party is nearing the biblical three score and 10 and seems to be a pretty robust specimen, but is still young enough to be spanked occasionally. When the Socialist Party cuts enough teeth to take solid nourishment without getting a stomach ache, we may feel proud of the kid. Who knows? But as the human race seems destined to try out every possible foolish thing that can be thought of, there is a possibility that we waste 15 or 20 years experimenting and chasing rainbows of respectability. As we have an eternity ahead of us, as well as an eternity behind us, I am not going to waste much sleep over the matter, but go hammering away in an effort to rebuild the shattered forces of the socialist movement. Thank you. Thanks, Reed. Um, Wayne? <clears throat> good, good evening. Uh, at least it is for me out here. Uh, I'm speaking as a uh, revolutionary anarchist socialist and uh, saying that uh, uh, my approach in the approach of anarchists in general uh, is somewhat different than that of others in that our focus is not on the Democratic Party in itself, 
but rather on opposition to the electoral system and the parliamentary system and any kind of belief that uh, fundamental changes can be achieved, revolutionary changes through elections. Uh, whereas I probably agree mostly with uh, with Reed and probably with the Gerald Smith about uh, the problems of the Democratic Party. Uh, many socialists, they, they probably might agree with the need for a uh, alternate party, a socialist party, a workers party, a labor party, a, a green party, whatever. Uh, and uh, such is not our perspective. Uh, in fact, it was the fundamental difference between uh, uh, this final basic split between Marx and uh, Bakunin back in the first international of uh, all the issues that were involved. The only one that really came to cause the actual final split was over the question of whether or not to form electoral parties to run parties, political parties of the working class to run elections and try to take over the governments and uh, manage them as a road to socialism. <clears throat> uh, both sides were in favor of unions but uh, the split was over whether to form uh, electoral parties. Um, now, what kind of perspective did that lead? A perspective from then up till now. Uh, well, let me give a, a, rather than go through an abstract discussion of the nature of the state, uh, let me just mention of the various major uh, transformations and struggles in this country uh, that have achieved uh, uh, successes and steps forward have almost entirely been uh, non-electoral, uh, extra legal, and outside of the political system, uh, political electoral system. Uh, uh, although uh, Harvey Kate uh, talked well about the uh, uh, the New Deal, uh, this was essentially motivated by the mass uh, rebellion of the workers in their massive strikes, you know, ma major strike wave, occupation of factories. Uh, fighting with the police and the National Guard, uh, boycotts and uh, general kind of upheavals uh, of uh, organizing of the unemployed and so forth. Uh, without this kind of upheaval from below, uh, there would have been no New Deal, uh, none of the, or the other benefits. Uh, similarly, uh, <clears throat> the civil rights struggle uh, was predominantly uh, outside of the election system, electoral system, in fact, had to be since black people didn't have the vote. Uh, in terms of massive civil disobedience. Uh, civil disobedience is a nice way of saying breaking the law. Uh, big demonstrations, uh, resisting the, the cops, and going all the way to the uh, urban rebellions, the so-called riots that shook the country. Uh, without these things, uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson and the Democrats would never have passed the uh, various anti uh, oppression, anti-discrimination laws. Uh, similarly, the struggle against the war in Vietnam was carried out through massive uh, demonstrations, civil disobedience, uh, a, a veritable mutiny in the army, uh, draft, card, uh, draft resistance, and so on. <clears throat> uh, struggle for gay people was uh, initiated through the uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, the Stonewall Rebellion and included the ACT UP civil disobedience uh, and the struggle for women's rights, uh, while not uh, specifically, sort of like, was, was in the context of these massive efforts. And it's precisely uh, the lack of these things, the downplaying of these things that have uh, lowered, decreased, uh, uh, permitted a return swing to the right. Now we are today have seen similar kind of upheavals from the women's uh, marches uh, uh, with Trump's election, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> up to the uh, uh, strikes, including uh, the teacher strikes, to the Amazon strike today, uh, the uh, massive the climate justice movement, uh, and of course, uh, the Black Lives Matter and George Floyd demonstrations, which are probably the biggest demonstration, maybe the biggest demonstration this country has ever had, as widespread as it's ever had. Now, the point of the Democrats has always been to take these movements and to channel them into some kind of safe electoral direction. Uh, I can't think of a more concrete example than uh, uh, in 2011 when the, uh, uh, in Wisconsin, 
when the right-wing government passed uh, major attacks on public employee unions, and there was a spontaneous upheaval, occup occupations of the capital, uh, of the capital in uh, Wisconsin, uh, though nonviolent, and a massive struggle, strikes, demonstrations, uh, conferences, all, all of these things broke out. And our comrades, the people in the IWW, uh, other revolutionary anarchists tried to talk up the idea of having general strike, uh, of the various unions getting together and calling a general strikes that would really show the power of workers and force the government to back down. Instead, the leaders of the unions, uh, in alliance with the Democratic Party, channeled the movement into an electoral direction to vote for uh, repeal and uh, withdrawal of the, uh, the uh, rejection of the governor and so forth, uh, something which utterly failed, utterly failed. Uh, and this demoralized and broke the, the mass movement at the time. <clears throat> now we're seeing this right now. We're seeing this kind of thing going on right now where the, the Democrats today uh, have two main jobs at Biden. One is, of course, to get the country uh, and the government back into uh, some kind of shape to uh, do use uh, competence and sanity uh, to uh, uh, deal with the various overlapping uh, sets of crises from the, uh, uh, the plague, the COVID plague to uh, the economy and so forth. And, uh, and whatever can be done by having a competent government will be done. But of course, the problem, unfortunately, the problems are much deeper than competence can solve. <clears throat> but the other major purpose is to channel all these upheavals into a safe direction, to knock off their heads, to turn the mass movements into something safe, channeling to elect somebody to go from your neighborhood to a faraway place in Washington to be political for you. And in fact, to serve big business the capitalist class, uh, rather than people directly fighting for their immediate interests through direct action. <clears throat> and uh, this is the main uh, nature of the, uh, the question of what is the left's relationship to the Democratic Party? This is what it's been. And if we look at the history of the various mass movements, we know that this is generally what's happened. What happened to the civil rights movement? What happened to the anti-war movements? What happened to uh, all of these movements is their tendency to be channeled into respectability, into quiescence, and particularly what happened to the labor unions. Uh, and they're trying to get the deal in right away. Like I, we noticed that the, uh, the Amazon strike that's going on right now in, uh, in, in Alabama, uh, the heads of the union organizing committee are also members of the uh, uh, Democratic National uh, Council. So they're trying to, right from the start, to have a union upsurge, but nevertheless is controlled. Uh, the Democrats look like they're swinging to the left, but that's only because of the depth of the crisis, which has, hasn't been this, this way since the Great Depression. Uh, they've got to do something. They have to look like they're doing something and they really want to do something to get things somewhat under, more under control. And they want to do something in order to channel the mass of people as the rebellion get out of their control which to us, uh, with our anti-electoral perspective, is exactly what we want more than anything else. Uh, let me finish here by saying, uh, when elections occur, uh, I, make it a, I do not try to persuade my friends and neighbors and coworkers, uh, though I'm now retired, my coworkers to uh, uh, who to vote for or not to vote. Uh, what an individual does uh, is makes very little difference in the general scheme of things here. The question is, what do we advocate for masses of people? What do we advocate for the unions? What do we advocate for the black community? What do we advocate for the organized environmentalists? What do we advocate for the uh, gay organizations? Uh, and what do we advocate for the organized women's movement? And these groups, which are today the basis, in fact, the root of the Democratic Party, uh, these groups uh, are, we say, do not waste your money and your human resources and your time on building up the Democratic Party, but organize yourself, move in a direction of independent direct action, political mass movements, organizing unions, organize a general strike, 
organizing uh, civil disobedience, one mass general strike in this country, one major upheaval in, in one city in this country would change its whole politics, which is why all the politicians from the right wing Republicans to the more most liberal of the Democrats, all is, are geared, are oriented to not letting that happen, to avoiding that from happening. Thank you. Thanks, Wayne. Gerald? Yes. My uh, presentation, unfortunately, has had to change because I think that people have raised things that don't need to be repeated. But what I did want to point out, and I, and I intend to point out, excuse me one second, I want to check myself. Okay. When we talk about the historical relationship between the left and the Democratic Party, I would I have to say that the Democratic Party precedes the formation of the left, as I understand it, in this country. I do not agree with Brother Harvey in his suggestion that left means liberal. I, I would argue that, in fact, left by definition means people today, today, means people who understand that liberalism is not enough. There's tremendous confusion about this. I am a member of the DSA, the Red Republican uh, Caucus advocates a break with the liberals. We advocate the, a break with the Democratic Party, a clean political break and the formation of a workers party. That is our main project at this moment. I think, so we have a difference of opinion on, on what actually constitutes the left. Uh, Joe Biden is not a leftist, even though he has been accused of such many, many times. I would argue also that Roosevelt was not a social democrat. And this, this I think is important because it brings the question of class into the question of party. What is a party? My understanding of the word party is it comes from the Latin part of, and we're talking about class parties. So the Democratic Party is a bourgeois party from my perspective. While certainly they oriented towards small businesses and, and the stuff that uh, I think Brother Reed had pointed out before correctly. The truth of the matter is they've always been and, and are the party of slavery, Jim Crow, and segregation. That is the origins of that organization. And co-optation is a key component of its strategy then and now. So first off, they co-opted or and worked with and formed alliances with various Ku Klux Klan organizations, uh, white supremacist groups like white citizens councils. This is how the South was ruled. You can't think of the Democratic Party without thinking of Dixiecrats. Uh, they went on to co-opt later on the Populist Party which was a pretty much a farmer labor uh, rebellion, primarily in the South. And their ability to co-opt this movement was big, a big setback, but uh, from the position of labor and genuine democracy. I think it's interesting when reading the biography of Watson, Tom Watson, who was a leader of the of the populist movement. At one point, the populists actually fought physically and defended black people from lynchings when they started. How quickly they degenerated under the influence of the Democrats 
to the point where they began to organize lynchings around their death knoll and absorption into the Democrats. The next major co-optation for the Democratic Party, in, from my opinion, is the labor movement was co-opted basically by the Democrats and became a major component or base of the Democratic Party and remains so today. And finally, the civil rights movement was co-opted pretty much by the Democratic Party and even the, I would argue the Black Power Movement. Why, why, how could this happen? It's very simple. There existed no mass alternative. And that is what I'm dedicated to trying to resolve. And I think that this, you know, this, this whole misunderstanding of history, I think that uh, Reed actually accurately depicted the early Socialist Party. But Reed, around the end, as much as I love Debs, he was faltering around the end of his life and kind of stumbled towards this farmer labor configuration. And that did not help his legacy, even though I think he was the true revolutionary of his period. Um, I would then say, so we, we understand the Democratic Party is what is the graveyard of social movements. That's what it is. That's how it existed through its co-optations. Now, the, once again, on the 30s, uh, this is uh, unfortunately a, a race from history and I wanna bring it up again. And that is this whole, after the third period, uh, misleadership in the common turn where the social Democrats were, were uh, deemed by Stalin to be social fascists and the catastrophe that that led to and that is the rise of Hitler to power without a single shot being fired. The, the common turn flip-flopped, panicked, and came up with a program called the, the Popular Front Against War and Fascism. And unfortunately, that remains their program today. They, today, we see the Stalinist stagger between some groups have the, you know, Stalinism under the gun often has this third period edge. And then of course, Stalinism in most of the advanced countries tends to be popular frontists in their approach. So we see a, a, a wavering back and forth from two losing strategies. Um, I think, we have to understand that, in fact, if we can summarize the crime of Stalinism that really, in this country, really affected us is one, the introduction of violence in the workers' movement. That's number one. And unfortunately, no one has really brought out why that is so harmful. Well, if we can't discuss politics, how can we struggle for unity? Violence within the workers' movement prevents that from even beginning. And the second, I think, major crime is the popular front. What is the popular front from my perspective? A po the popular front is an agreement between particularly workers' parties on the one hand and bourgeois parties that they will unite electorally behind a common program. Well, the, it's not possible to have a common program with the class enemy that brings up the fact that we want to bring an end to private property. The capitalists are not so capitulatory that they would join such a formation. Unfortunately, the leadership or misleadership of the workers has proven time and again their willingness to do so, France, Spain, Chile, 
the list goes on. Uh, I, I, I would like to move a little bit ahead though to my experience in the civil rights movement and later on in other organizations, I can see the importance of a labor party, a workers party of political independence of the proletariat cannot be overstated. When no such alternative exists, you find the strangest things happen. For instance, in uh, the, the 2016 election, which Bernie Sanders ran in the primary and of course in the latest uh, I want you to know I respect the people that support him. I respect Bernie Sanders. I do not agree with them. And I say my view is that Bernie Sanders was basically a Judas goat for the Democrats. And that is to say, what is a Judas goat? That's Americana. So I know a lot of people aren't into farms. Judas goat is the one we send out to herd the other goats to come into the slaughterhouse, see? And then we kill all the other goats and we send the Judas goat back out there to get some more, all right? That's unfortunately the role that Bernie Sanders played, whether we like it or not. We have to look objectively, that's what happened. But in the process, 90,000 young people are now currently in a group that I'm in called the Democratic Socialists of America, I understand the specific history with the Democratic Socialists of America, their pro-imperialism, their anti-communism, but I'm looking at thousands of young people who think they want to be socialists and I wanna fight for them, to transform them before I leave this earth. So I, I'm thinking when we talk about these Democrats, I have to move it up and talk about the civil rights and the Democrats, because I remember this. This is something I lived through. Uh, many of you may have heard of Emmett Till. To give you an example of who I call him Sleepy Joe, because I think that's a fair characterization. So. What was Sleepy Joe's position on civil rights? He always opposed integration of the schools, always. Anybody that wants to be a class conscious proletarian fighter must understand that we cannot unite the class unless we pay special attention to those who are specially oppressed. This is how they keep us apart. And I think, you know, so to say, well, we, we're for unity. I, I, in the DSA, it's popular to say, well, look, wouldn't it be nice if we had Medicare for all? Then wouldn't that help Black people too? Of course it would. But you can't get to first base unless you can unite your class. And that's what's wrong with this so-called universalism on the part of the DSA. They mean well, they're 99% white. That is not good. We have to struggle against that. We have to develop a program against that. Here's what happens when you follow people like Sleepy Joe. Uh, when Emmett Till was killed, a young man from Chicago went to um, visit his family in Mississippi let me just check my time. I don't want to go over. Okay, I have to hurry up. But this, just, this gives you a real sense of the fallacy of following these Democrats. Sleepy Joe was new to the, um, to the um, you know, being a senator. And who he wound up forming an alliance with was a gentleman named James Oliver Eastman. And what they did, this is sometimes people say, oh, well, he was new. You know, they want to make excuses for him, right? He was new. Yeah, well, wasn't new about what he, nothing new about what he did. In order to 
persuade the American public that the Emmett Till, first of all, Emmett Till's murderers were found innocent in Mississippi. So what could they do to prevent people from saying that something needs to be done? What they did was um, Louis Till, his father, was executed in Italy. It winds up that he had been accused of raping an Italian woman. Further research has proven that this was a racist in the military that framed him up and led to him being executed. Biden helped Eastman get this information and they, they published this information in the Saturday Evening Post, it was called, in order to discredit the idea that justice had not been served to Emmett Till, basically arguing that he's from a family of rapists. That's your Democratic Party. I think we can do better. We can do better and will do better from a party that offers us nothing but lies, unemployment, and Oxycontin. I think a workers party is a step forward and I think we can do it, but we have to break politically now. I'm gonna stop right there. Thanks, Gerald. Okay, so the format uh, from this point uh, forward is we're gonna give uh, the panelists uh, two minutes each to respond to each other's opening remarks. Then we're gonna open it up to the Q&A. Um, so questions are coming uh, via the Q&A in the Zoom feed. I would like to uh, request that our panelists not respond directly to the questions as they show up in the Q&A feed, but I will relay them um, and, and verbalize them so that uh, everyone has a chance to uh, uh, hear and, and reply to them. Um, so Harvey, if you could begin round of responses. Yeah, for, first I wanna say that I was actually moved by, by everyone's remarks, which may seem strange given the diversity of the remarks. Um, but I do wanna, uh, let me just say that I, I spoke as a, as, as a socialist and radical historian about the 30s. I haven't said anything about the Democratic Party today, and I do not belong to the Democratic Party. I am actually a longtime member of DSA, um, though relatively inactive other than paying my dues for, for several years. Um, so yeah, we are a brother, Gerald and Harvey uh, brothers. Okay, and I'm also a unionist. I've been in, in various unions. I remain on, I'm now on the retiree council for the AFT here in Wisconsin. But what, I wanna just make a few, I, I have to respond as the historian in me. First of all, um, while I absolutely believe that no change occurs of worthwhile strictly from the top down. I absolutely believe in the imperative of struggle from the bottom up. And if you look into any of my work, you'll, you'll see the degree to which I'm, I'm committed to that, to that idea and that historical reality. But it is the case in the, in the 1930s, first of all, uh, Wayne, that the struggles that you referred to, occupation of the factories and so on, were actually motivated by the fact that FDR had empowered workers to pursue those things. The, the union movement at the beginning of the 30s was weak, terribly weak, and it, was, and it was in the National Industrial Recovery Act for a start that FDR empowered workers to organize, and millions did. And in fact, um, the only reason they need, later needed the National Labor Relations Act is because company unions were formed under the rules of the National Industrial Recovery Act. That's first, okay? The, the other thing I wanna say is that um, regarding the Wisconsin Rising, since I was there, I wanna make it clear, okay, that the Democratic Party screwed us, yes, okay? Obama said he would march with workers. He, he didn't even talk about our rising, and, but the rising was defeated not only by the fact that the Democratic Party is the Democratic Party, it was also defeated by the divide between private sector workers and public sector workers that capitalists and, and conservatives and neoliberals had literally stirred the pot on for years. So, okay, so let me make it clear. I. I have little regard for the possibility that the Democratic Party is our salvation. However, I have little hope right now that a workers party could achieve 
anything at this given historical moment until we really do revive labor unionism in this country. And I'm maybe dreaming, but I see the Amazon workers struggle in Alabama as it could literally be a light, the lighting of a fire. Because we've seen, as I think someone mentioned, that for several years now, there has been a percolation from the bottom up. But what has been missing, okay, besides uh, undeniably the teacher strikes, Chicago, West Virginia, and otherwise, but the fact is, what we need right now is a fire lit inside of the labor movement on a broader scale. And I'm hoping that this Amazon union vote can be the beginning of that. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna keep it quick. Okay, sorry. Reed. Um, so, I, Wayne, I don't have a lot to say in response to your presentation, but I did just wanna bring up an anecdote that, um, that comes to mind when I think about anarchism in the context of American politics and specifically the Socialist Party, namely that at the um, 1897 or 98, um, I think it was 97 meeting at which the social democracy of America was founded, which would later become Socialist Party of America, the famous anarchist Emma Goldman was present. And, and after, um, after witnessing Deb's speak, she um, went to lunch with him at which she said, why Mr. Debs, you're an anarchist. Um, so I always thought that uh, that was kind of an interesting anecdote. Um, I don't, you can respond to that if you'd like it. Um, uh, Gerald mentioned um, that uh, the, that at the end of Debs's life, he faltered on his, um, Intrans intransigence um, with respect to the uh, Farmer Labor Party project. And I actually wrote an article for the Platypus Review on this subject um, titled, Would Eugene Debs Support Socialists Running as Democrats? Um, and I go into a, quite a bit of depth dealing with the episode of the Conference for Progressive Political Action that the Socialist Party was engaged with in the 20s towards the end of Debs's life. So I won't rehash that now, but I will just kind of summarize by saying that by the end of that project or the Socialist Party's in involvement with that project, the takeaway for Debs was that he was reaffirmed in his earlier convictions and that the entire endeavor had been an error but the, the one value that it had was that it proved right the position he had taken for the decades prior. Um, and um, Harvey, so, you know, your presentation re reminded me of um, a famous apocryphal quote from um, the kind of successor of Eugene Debs and the Socialist Party as their presidential candidate and sort of spiritual leader, Norman Thomas, who allegedly said um, that uh, the American people will never kn knowingly adopt socialism, but under the name of liberalism, they will adopt every fragment of the socialist program until one day America will be a socialist nation without knowing how it happened. I no longer need to run as a presidential candidate for the Socialist Party the Democratic Party has adopted our platform. This is a quote that's long been attributed to Thomas. Uh, Ronald Reagan, among others, attributed it to him, but it's never been substantiated as something that he said. There's no, no documentary evidence that this is something that Thomas said. And so this is something that he allegedly said later, though, not in the 30s. In the 40s, in the, yeah, in the 40s, but it's still, it's not, um, it's not substantiated that he, that he said that. Um, so, you know, it's, you know, Thomas was maybe not the same man as Debs, but he was pretty consistent, at least in the earlier period, certainly during the 30s. He did run against Roosevelt, not only in 32, but also in 36 and 40. And I would contest the characterization that the Popular Front included socialists. Now, it did include people that identified as socialists, certainly. And there was a group in the Socialist Party that was wooed by the New Deal and ultimately ended up leaving the Socialist Party and some of whom joined the Roosevelt administration. Um, but the Socialist Party on the whole um, was not a part of the Popular Front and indeed opposed the Popular Front um, on the presidential ticket and among, among other places. And, and also in, for example, in struggles against the Communist Party and the CIO and, and things like that. Um, and I agree with Gerald that 
I don't think there's any sense in which you could describe Roosevelt as a social democrat if you're taking that term in the sense in which it was used in the decades from 1848 up to at least 1914, if not later than that. Um, certainly in the in the Debsian context, so the context of Debsian socialism, what social democrat meant was clear. It meant you wanted the working class to take power and to transform society through um, the, the collectivization of private property. Um, so that's all I have to say. Thanks. Uh, Wayne? Uh, the real question in following an approach to the Democratic Party is first beyond that is, uh, is your attitude towards the state whether you believe that this state can be used to create socialism through some kind of elections or some other method. It's quite true, of course, that some gains can be made. Revolutionaries of all sorts have always been in favor of, well, most revolution in favor of winning reforms. And uh, the reforms that Harvey mentions are uh, were real. But it's like saying, uh, uh, the workers can make a demand, say, on a particular firm, on a capitalist firm, and to say, we want better wages, we want this reform, we want uh, shorter hours, et cetera, et cetera. And one wing of management will be for granting these reforms, uh, throwing the dogs, uh, you know, a bone, and one wing will be for fighting against the tooth and nail. That's the Democrats and Republicans, liberals and conservatives. And the workers may well win some reforms, especially in times that aren't too bad, like they're now. They may win certain reforms. That doesn't mean that capitalist management is anything other than capitalist. That doesn't mean it's on the side of the workers. And the same thing is true of winning something from the capitalist state or the capitalist party, such as the Democrats. It's still a capitalist state and it's the capitalist party. Uh, sure, in relation to uh, uh, saying FDR wants, the president wants you to uh, join a union and so forth. There was a, yes, there was a dialectical back and forth uh, with the workers, uh, Roosevelt responding to the pressure from below, which I believe was the major, a major factor here, plus the objective fact of uh, uh, there was a depression and the capitalists didn't want it, wanted some way to get out of it. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, so he gave, raised reforms that the workers had raised. And on the other hand, the workers, uh, and the union leaders, especially more reverent ones, seized upon his uh, apparent support and used that to motivate some of the more backward workers. And this went back and forth. I'm not denying that. I am saying, however, that the fundamental dynamic and where we should be, we the radicals, we the revolutionaries, we the socialists, should be on the side of the mass upheaval from below, not working together in a united front or in a pop, I'm sorry, in a popular front with bourgeois parties and bourgeois forces. Uh, same point about the point about the Wisconsin again. I say the thing is that there wasn't a drive to make a general strike. Whether that would have succeeded, whether they could have won over the mass of workers if there hadn't been a, a, the barrier to the uh, of the liberals and the, and the union bureaucrats and the Democrats, if say anarchists and wobblies and other radicals had been had enough to build an, an organization or or a grouping of organization federation or whatever of organizations to fight for a general strike, I don't know. And if it had been a general strike, whether one, I can't, I don't know. But that's to me the only perspective for actually winning something. I think right now, uh, the point of Debs and Goldman is, uh, uh, yes, Debs had a certainly a libertarian side. There's no question about it. his spirit and so forth. And I'm sure whatever reality is to this anecdote, uh, no question anarchists feel and revolutionary socialists of all sort, whatever our disagreements with Debs, uh, we feel a sympathy in re responding to him and, and to this, this tradition, that's, that's certainly true. Debs did join the IWW. Yes, he did, Found, founded it. Helped form it, right. yeah, helped yes. form it. That's right. Okay, thanks Wayne. Uh, Gerald. Yes, uh, I tend to lean toward what Wayne just said, uh, by the way, and Harvey, I, I, you know, we're gonna have differences of opinion. There's no possibility of unity, of struggling to work together without intelligent discourse. I challenge you in the following way. There were three general strikes for me 
a general strike is not just a strike. It's not a simple, you know, economic, it becomes purely social and very political very early on. And there were three general strikes in the United States in the year 1934 alone. And that is uh, the Autolite strike that started with Autolite in, in, in Toledo, I think that was. And then of course, the general strike that occurred in Minneapolis, um, you know, the truckers and then or the Teamsters, I'm sorry. And then the general strike that occurred in San Francisco in 1934. I would like to submit to you, I want you to think about this because you say, and, I, and I'm quoting you, you said FDR empowered the workers. I believe he saved capitalism. And the reason I, I can demonstrate that is because the reforms recognizing the right to unionize, et cetera, did not precede those general strikes. They happened after those general strikes. And, and that meant that he saw that as a warning to capitalism. And in my opinion, that means that he saw that if they didn't take a rational step to accommodate legitimate grievances on the part of the working class, and that means the right to unionize with all that follows, that there could be a general, what, what you wanna call a, a, a civil war in the United States and the capitalists could not and would not win. And that just means that he was more rational than his other bourgeois opponents at that time. So I just want you to think about that because that's, I think, chronologically what actually occurred. Yeah, well, okay. I, let me just say that um, I, 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 I've written about this if you want to read it sometime. The National Industrial Recovery Act of 1933 gave workers the power to organize unions. And the, and the mobilizations that occurred in the cities you referred to, as well as the textile workers massive uh, organizing in North Carolina and elsewhere were empowered by FDR's signing of the National Industrial Recovery Act. Now, I'll also add that FDR, I, I called him a social democrat. I did not call him a socialist as we would think of a socialist. He's, he would never have been a member of DSA, whatever form DSA took. <laughs> but I then also want to note, and I think this is important, is that um, he actually did call for the redistribution of wealth. And that redistribution was to take the form of taxation on the bourgeoisie, which he did initiate, and also by way of the organization of workers, okay? And um, I'll just, one last story and then I'll stop. And that is in 1936, when the auto workers occupied the plant in Flint, Michigan, um, the local authorities and the, the thugs that the capitalists hired were ready to storm the plant. And the governor of Michigan, Frank Murphy, a Democrat, a Catholic social justice Democrat, very close to FDR, called in the National Guard and he ordered the guard to stand around the plant with their bayonets outward, not inward. He was prepared to use the guard against the capitalists and the thugs. This was the same Frank Murphy who FDR appointed attorney general and later appointed to the Supreme Court. I'll leave it at that. Okay, thanks. Um, <clears throat> so now uh, we will turn to questions posed by the audience. We have a bunch that have came in, uh, in that have come in in the last uh, hour, really, from the beginning of our of our panel discussion. And so I'm going to try to. Um, uh, deal with them in in groups. Uh, a few people have uh, posted uh, questions. Uh, so uh, Brock poses the question uh, or a series of questions. Um, what is the role of the dictatorship of the proletariat in achieving socialism? Especially curious about Dr. K's thoughts, but of course the question is open to um, everyone, and then he, he amends that to say, what is the role of the dictatorship of the proletariat 
if there is in fact any role whatsoever. Um, and uh, a related question that he followed up with is how, how do we utilize reform and electoralism for the purpose of achieving a classless society? Because I think those are related questions. So if you guys would like to respond to that. Well, can I, I'll just say that, look, there are, there are various pamphlets that I think are the, the great texts for the left in modern history. I think it's Thomas Paine's Common Sense. I think it's uh, the Communist Manifesto and uh, the others are, they're escaping me at this moment, but those are crucial. But I think that the, ter I think that Marx's use of the term dictatorship of the proletariat is a, is, he meant it as he wrote it, but I don't think he imagined it to mean dictatorship of the proletariat, okay? Now, having said that, I just wanna say that the role of reform it would be that, are we ready for socialism? Is that somehow in our DNA? I don't know, I don't think so. Labor unionism is supposed to be a schooling for democracy. I think the, the goal of any kind of serious socialist movement is to constantly, constantly seek the enhancement of freedom, equality, and democracy and the classical Western ideals of those. And I also think as a consequence that as one enhances democratic possibilities and democratic experience that one is literally preparing the road for workers' democratic control. May I, may Go I? Ahead. Go ahead, okay, I don't wanna jump ahead of nobody. Is it okay? Okay. Uh, first of all, to Harvey, come on, you're a historian. Don't ever talk about Marx's intentions and the dictatorship of the proletariat. The, the historical record is clear. For instance, his critique of the Gotha program makes clear what he really thought about the dictatorship of the proletariat. I would like to proceed. And that is the Paris Commune. He actually wrote a book about how the Paris Commune was the dictatorship of the proletariat. There's a popular misconception that goes on. I had it when I was about 10 years old. I went, um, you know, my father was a Stalinist, good man. And he, he shared a lot of information. I did not understand the dictatorship of the proletariat. I said, that's a dictatorship, that's bad. Why do we call it that? Well, I was only 10, but I, I did spend time with people that explained to me what it actually meant. And above all, I think it is worthwhile to mention the work of Leon Trotsky in studying the first sustained dictatorship of the proletariat, and that is in the Soviet Union. He wrote a book called The Revolution Betrayed. And I strongly urge, particularly our young people, take a look at that book because that explains some of the misconceptions that we have still today, okay? I believe that the dictatorship, the word means dominance. So the dominance of a class, every class society has to have somebody is gonna rule it. And I believe that the way that the dictatorship of the proletariat, that is the beginning for me at least, of what Marx called human, this is not me, this is Marx said this, of, of human society. This is the first time when humankind, when we have a majority of dictatorship of the proletariat's situations in the major countries, we can begin to plan our future. And that means planning our economy. With all of the errors and problems in the Soviet Union, we did get a glimpse of what planned economy can offer humanity. So I believe that yes, the dictatorship of the proletariat is and will be the beginning of international planning of the economy and a major step forward for humanity. Now on the question of elections and socialism, I would say I'm, I'm involved in elections. I, I don't believe that 
we, we can neglect. I mean, when the billionaires are running the schools and they're paying people to take over the schools and then they're shutting the schools down, I don't think that's something we should abstain from. So the DSA in the East Bay, uh, we call ourselves the um, school justice, the classroom justice committee. We participated and supported people who were opposed to the privatization of the schools and we defeated Go Public Schools with their billions. They spent a million dollars to defeat our candidates. We beat them in three out of four races and I'm, I think that's good. It's not enough, brother. It's not enough. We we have to, I think, be humble and look at elections as what they are. And what they really are for socialism and really all they can be is a test of strength. I, I reject the program of Edward Bernstein in evolutionary socialism, and I embrace the critique put forward by Rosa Luxemburg in her reformer revolution. Guys, you got to look at that stuff. You got to study history and socialism. I'm going to stop there. If I if I could just respond quickly as well, um, you know, in my response to to Harvey, I read that apocryphal um, Thomas quotation. I actually I I intended to contrast it with another quotation that is relevant to this question. So I hope you'll indulge me. It's brief. Thomas did say on the campaign trail in 36, it is our task to stand four square on our own program and to make it plain. What is that program? It is socialism. It is the doctrine that since power driven machinery has made this an age of collectivism, we must make collectivism cooperate in order to end poverty in the midst of potential plenty. The old deal failed catastrophically. A return to it is unthinkable. The New Deal has already failed and is headed toward new catastrophe of war or new economic collapse. Um, and I read that in particular because, you know, this idea that, for example, capitalist politicians could appropriate elements of the socialist program piecemeal misses the entire point of the socialist program, which is not to raise particular reform demands. Socialist programs do raise particular reform demands, but not as the ends to be pursued, but as means to an end. And the end to be pursued is the political power of the working class. And that's what socialism means above all else. It's also the process that unfolds on the basis of that political power. But first and foremost, what it means to fight for socialism for at least the Debsian tradition and the second international Marxism that it came from was to fight for the political power of the working class. And the Socialist Party of America thought not only that it was possible to do that through electoral contests, but it, that it was necessary to do so but they didn't fight in electoral contests to win reforms. They fought for reforms in order to build themselves up as the representative of the working class in order to raise the working class to political power. Um, so I'll just, uh, and one, one brief note about the dictatorship of the proletariat since it came up. It's not a term that has a lot of currency in the American tradition. It comes up here and there usually in reference to historical discussions of Marx's work. Um, but Hillquit, who is certainly not among the most radical members of the party, did say in 1920 that um, basically what Gerald just said, that, that what Marx and Engels meant by the term, we agree with that term, but we don't use it because of the connotations of the word dictatorship in our context. And he specifically by that meant the working class forcibly disenfranchising the bourgeoisie without in, in making an earnest effort to take power by legal means. Um, so that's what scared people like Hillquit about the term. Um, but he also said at the same time that he did not consider the Soviet Union to be a dictatorship of the proletariat because it was not a majority working class country. It was a majority peasant country. But nonetheless, he unconditionally supported the fledgling power and considered it to be democratic and admired Trotsky and Lenin for installing a democratic government in Russia. So. Wayne. May I say something on this subject? First, let me say in the dictatorship of the proletariat, which somehow leaped into the, <laughs> into, into the subject on the, on the 
left of the Democratic Party. Uh, the Marxist scholar Hal Draper uh, looked up every time that Marx or Engels had used the term. Uh, they think they found about essentially 12 different times in their various writings. And they were all in the context of exactly what Ger Gerald says, the meaning being to them at that time in the 1800s of uh, meaning the rule of the domination of the working class, of the working class and its allies. Uh, it was only under Lenin and Trotsky that the term came to mean the rule of a party and under the dictatorship of the party. And then under Stalin that it became the dictatorship of one person, uh, which is why even those of us who believe that the workers should come to take power uh, would not use the phrase today, except for some small esoteric uh, groupings. Uh, the problem with Marx's concept, even, that, even in his most democratic form, was the belief that uh, uh, the workers could take power using the bourgeois state. Uh, this is something that he may have vacillated on, but right after the Paris Commune, his main effort was to uh, push for every section of the international to uh, form political parties to run in elections and to try to take over by electoral means the various uh, capitalist states. Uh, the state cannot be used in this method. The workers cannot take power through the state using elections or revolutionary and setting up their own new state, but only through their own self-organization of the masses of working people. Uh, I'm not sure about the last point about the DNA that Harvey raised. If you mean that right now, obviously, the idea of saying that people could make a socialist revolution is uh, pretty non-existent. Uh, yeah, sure, that's true. Uh, although we don't know how history goes. So, uh, Certainly, I didn't expect to see the collapse of the Soviet Union or the end of apartheid in South Africa. All sorts of major upheavals have happened in the world uh, that we didn't you know, necessarily expect. Uh, nevertheless, I would say, uh, first of all, whether or not people are ready for socialism, uh, this system is in a state of a decline and crisis that if we don't have socialism, we are facing really, really terrible future. Uh, and uh, secondly, uh, my point from before, as a practical matter, I think people are less likely to accept the idea of right now forming a labor party or a workers party or something, uh, breaking the Democratic Party than they are for they take the idea of general strikes, mass union drives, independent mass action. I think people are more willing to see that as an immediate practical possibility than they are to see a total upheaval of the, of the political uh, establishment. Okay, let me pose uh, some further questions. Um, so, and this, this actually speaks to what we were just talking about. I'm gonna go a little bit out of order um, of, the, of the questions as they were posed. Um, there's a question about, uh, from uh, Ed, who asks, uh, that a number of you are familiar with the Marxist concept of Bonapartism. Do you understand the Democratic Party as a Bonapartist party? If so, what makes it so? And finally, has the Democratic Party historically and today taken up any political and societal tasks that would need to be taken up by a socialist movement and or party? Um, the related question is, um, Wayne, well, you correctly noted that the social movements you mentioned, labor, women, gay, Black Lives Matter, et cetera, comprise the social base of the Democratic Party. And uh, Ed says, I believe, Reed, following the example of the Socialist Party of America, would argue that socialists should build independent social bases for socialism rather than trying to win away those existing social bases from the Democrats. And he would like to hear each of you argue for your respective positions regarding that. I think those are two related questions about uh, the Bonapartist party uh, character of the Democrats uh, in historically Marxist terms. Um, what would, how would socialists need to take up things that are now, now taken up by a party like the Democratic Party? 
And what about uh, independent social bases rather than trying to win away the social bases of the capitalist parties, like, like in the case of the Democrats? All right. Uh, first of all, I'm not quite sure about the point about the winning away perspective. Certainly we want to win the majority of the working people in this country. Uh, whether they are currently supporting the Democrats or currently supporting the Republicans, uh, as we wish to win over certainly the vast majority of uh, black people and uh, very and people of color and uh, all the oppressed and so forth. Uh, if we take away all, if, if you leave those people out and say we're not trying to reach them, then I don't know who's left. Uh, so, so I'm not sure of the question. That doesn't mean that we want to write that we assume we're going to take over, say, the local Democratic Party club. Uh, they have to, but the general population certainly want to reach. Uh, bonapartism is a basic notion that the state has been getting larger and larger and dominant force, uh, even through the under the Republicans and those who claim to be for small government, uh, is absolutely true. And the Democrats are indeed the party that's been pushing for a bigger state. And their solutions, even to things that we all want, uh, for example, well, you can go to your last point about uh, things that we would do. Certainly, uh, we would propose on health care, we anarchists would propose something, uh, as long as the state is there and has the money, I um, have no problem demanding that it pay out money for health care, but, but I would rather it be carried out through uh, democratically organized uh, cooper health cooperatives of, and community organizations of various sorts. I think that's certainly very practical, very possible. And uh, I would want the government to pay for that as opposed to the bureaucratic uh, medical establishment that, uh, that they tend to use. Uh, <clears throat> so that answers that that's, that's two of the questions. But certainly the point about, it's important about the Democratic Party that while people on the left is all excited about the things that seem to be positive, the more efficient uh, layout of uh, the, the coronavirus and so on and so forth, there is also a tendency in the Democrats to increase political repression. After all, it was the Democrats who passed the, uh, the great prison and crime bills uh, led by Biden in the past. And even now, uh, the drive to, uh, to deal with the semi-fascist uh, occupiers and so on uh, is also setting things up, I think, for a greater repression towards the left to use the same kind of methods towards the next Black Lives Matter mass demonstrations and so forth. Uh, so we have to be you know, careful about that. Can't just assume that, well, they're showing that the government can be used for good. Yeah, but that government is also gonna be used for ill. And uh, especially if you add together, which almost is never talked about, their use of expansion of military uh, uh, forces and so forth, uh, that's it. Um, maybe since I was addressed in the question, I could just respond uh, to the point I think Ed was um, assuming I, I would take up and I, you know, I do agree with the thrust of what he's saying. I think the question needs to be clarified um, in terms of what is meant by social bases, what are social bases of the Democratic Party, and um, you know, I think in the, in the context of the Debsian tradition, they were very clear about what the social appeal of the Democratic Party was and what it was based on. It was based on the promises that the politicians made to various constituency groups. And in a sense, the favors that they would offer in exchange for their votes. They would they like to use the, the term, the, uh, the loaves and fishes that the Democratic Party would offer to the people. Um, and you know the, the Socialist Party was vehemently opposed to this approach of politics of offering various favors, whether those take the form of sort of noble sounding reforms or more kind of you know sketchy you know trading of of you know it, you know um, whatever kinds of uh, benefits can be scraped out of um, you know holding office. Um, you know, the Socialist Party was not at all interested in winning people over that were looking to politicians to do favors for them. And that, in, you know, again, that includes anything from, you know, shortening the working day or uh, legalizing trade unions or whatever to, you know, 
um, literally handing out bottles of rum or something like that. So um, in terms of building independent bases of social power, um, it would be an entirely different basis for a political appeal. Namely, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be that the, the political party is doing something for people that they can't do for themselves, but that the political party represents the efforts of people to do things for themselves. For example, trade union organizing, forming cooperatives, forming friendly societies, other forms of social action by which the working class struggled to overcome the limitations of its condition and met those limitations head on, thereby coming to to grips potentially with the need for political representation and the socialists were there to offer the, um, the political representation they needed to overcome those limitations potentially. Um, in terms of uh, Bonapartism, it was more common in the American tradition to, to make reference to Bismarckian socialism. Um, it was a more familiar reference point for the, the German uh, speaking constituency that was familiar with the Social Democratic Party in Germany and its relationship to the Bismarck regime. Um, but Marx considered that to be a form of Bonapartism. So I think it's, it's relevant. And, you know, um, one example that pops into my mind, one of the most popular pamphlets, uh, propaganda pamphlets in the early days of the Socialist Party of America by George Herron um, predicted that um, socialism was coming one way or another, but there's many different ways in which you could mean the word socialism. And we have what we mean by socialism, but there's also the imperialistic or Bismarckian socialism by which the state would own the people rather than the people, the state. It's a kind of formulation you're more likely to find among libertarians today than socialists. Um, and essentially the idea was going back to that idea of doing favors for people that the state would in essence bribe the working class that was Bismarck himself described his own uh, project as bribing the working class in order to ameliorate them on the one hand while at the same time forcibly repressing their political expression by making socialism illegal <laughs> through the uh, anti-socialist law. Um, of course, Woodrow Wilson's progressivism is a perfect example of this in in the uh, in the uh, sedition acts and um, and so on. So, I think you could extend it further, but I'll leave it there. Uh, Harvey, anything to respond to? No, I just pass on that one. Okay, I'm, I'm, I, I want to get it going. I I suspect there may be some confusion on the question of what is Bonapartism. I, do, I don't believe that Bonapartism is ascribed to an entire political party. The term actually is preceded by the term Caesarism. And I thank Reed for mentioning this, you know, the Bismarck. Uh, so it is more of an individual as far as I'm concerned. Who, who may or may not be a part of a major party, rising above society and balancing himself between various classes. I think um, Reed was, was useful to point out the bribery and at the same time, the suppression at the same time. This is a Bonapartist move as far as I'm concerned. So I would just say, um, look at the actual definition again and the history of it. And I, I, think, uh, I think I might be right on that one. Um, the Democratic Party, its base is uh, uh, ecologists and the Black Lives Matter and the trade unions. Our job is to split the base from the top. And I think that it's pretty clear we have an exceptional situation right now. And I and I I'm 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 very optimistic about the possibilities. It's not so much a political matter, it's a matter of political will, as far as I'm concerned, of people who truly want to break with the class enemy. The reason that the Democratic Party can politically exploit uh, their base, or what you were referring to as their base, is because 
There's no alternative. That is a major reason that they can continue to play this game. This, uh, uh, so, so they're gonna tell you, well, we got the first black woman. Oh, she's not only black, she's Jamaican. Oh, and, and she's Indian. And she's a viper. Get them. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I deal with lots and lots and lots of people that are in the Black Lives Matter movement. And to tell you the truth, they don't look to the Democrats. It doesn't take much. It was just uh, this, this Trumpian stuff was so ugly that it, you know, with no alternative, they were able to herd people over. And not many, 73 million people voted for Trump. And I believe that some of those are our class brothers and sisters. In fact, 10% of them voted for Bernie in the primary, in both primaries, 10% of them. And then they turn around and vote for Trump. How is that possible? Maybe they were looking for someone to shake up the system. Maybe they believed the malarkey that Mr. Trump served up when he was running. Remember, he said he was going to, oh, we, we have to have, you know, a medical system, suggesting that he might support Medicare for all. He said he was going to refashion the American infrastructure. Yes, he did. That made him look somewhat appealing to the Democrats versus the Democrats. So I see both parties have workers that uh, mistakenly are under their influence. And that is the fight. Split the base from the top. I'm going to stop with that. Okay. Um, my apologies to some of the questions that were, that were posed. Um, because we're not going to have a chance to get to all, but I want to uh, pose a combined question from a few uh, people in the Q&A um, before we, or maybe as a way of leading into concluding remarks so that we're able to end on time at, at uh, 8 p.m. Central Time. Um, so one is posed uh, by an anonymous attendee who asks about the place of the political independence of the working class. And uh, is it at all um, admittable to sacrifice that independence in order to achieve reforms? Um, another question that's a related question is uh, by Jason. He said, um, uh, could you address how anti-fascism has become a cornerstone of the Democratic Party's politics today, quote unquote anti-fascism, and how this hinders the formation of a mass independent socialist party. That, that, um, you, would you repeat that? that? That doesn't make sense to me, the question. <laughs> uh -huh. um, okay, so um, could you address how the, uh, the Democrats have posed as the supposed anti-fascist party, um, you know, contra Trump and his supporters, and ha and does how does this hinder the formation of a mass independent working class socialist uh, politics? Um, so I would uh, I would combine those those two questions from our anonymous uh, attendee as well as from Jason. Um, and then pose that to you guys about the independence of the working class. And, um, you know, are we scared out of the independence of the working class by the need to fight fascism? Oh, I got that. I, I don't want to jump the line. Come on, y'all. Well, I, I, I'm not even sure that I can address it properly, but look, just to make it clear, my political aspirations are right now undeniably reformist when it comes to politics because of what I see as the crisis we're in. But I do want to say that my hopes are, and I'm work, I, I work exactly in that manner, to build the, uh, the creation of a working class aware of its own power. So to me, labor unionism is the means by which to do that. Um, the, a, 
a working class emerges out of a struggle. And I think that the, the, that the possibilities in the next year for working class struggle are greater than ever. And I think it's gonna have to be around unionism. In fact, I often think that we're distracted by politics um, so that we think that the, the means by which we could achieve socialism would be through the Democratic Party. But it's also the case, I think it's more important right now to build the labor movement. That, that's what I would say. Um, there's a follow-up question, in fact, uh, that is directed at you, Harvey, which is to say that you mentioned the fire being lit by the Amazon workers and their um, current organizing efforts. Um, uh, how could the contemporary left utilize that if indeed that is what happens to generate momentum for a movement towards socialism? Could you articulate the relationship there? Well, the labor movement, would, the labor movement will generate its own leaders. And, they, and the only question is to what extent we're involved in it ourselves. Look, I, I'm a labor unionist, so I don't see myself standing outside. But it does strike me that in contrast to generations past, we have organizations of, of we have labor organizations of folks who are themselves not even necessarily, you know, they're not warehouse workers, they're not factory workers, they are airline flight attendants. I mean, we're, the labor movement is diverse. And in fact, I actually imagine that we're going to see in the next several months that the, the foremost figure in the new labor movement will be a woman flight attendant, Sarah Nelson. And I think that, I, I don't know what it will mean in terms of building socialism. I would be, I'm most immediately really concerned about building the labor movement. And I think out of the labor movement, the sense of workers' possibilities will emerge. And, and I would just say, if anybody's interested, they should go onto YouTube and listen to Sarah Nelson's address to a DSA gathering about two years ago. And I think that's a, a sign of possibilities for the future. Um, a couple of uh, related questions that will be the final questions that we uh, end off with. One is from Lewis, um, which is, I appreciate the historical perspective of the panelists, but he's struck by um, how most of the history is about 100 years old, almost nearly, even the 1930s is uh, 80 or 90 years in the past. How does this history affect the current state of the Democratic Party and what feels like its degenerated state? Um, how, how do the panelists feel about the recent invocation of FDR by Biden and the much discussed Green New Deal? How should the historical distinction between these new deals affect how we approach the Democratic Party's politics today? And similarly from Danny, we have the question, uh, what is the point of appealing to the New Deal as a defining legacy of the Democratic Party in 2021? What does that make the, Dem or why does that make the Democratic Party any better than the Republican Party today? Or does it? Doesn't, it? it doesn't make the Democratic Party any better than anything today. Um, though I do, think it's, uh, I do think it's better than the Republican Party. I mean, the Republican Party is filled with fascists and white supremacists at, in their leadership. Um, I mean, I, the Senator from Wisconsin, my own state, Ron Johnson, made that very clear the other night in his remarks. Um, in defense of Bernie to some extent, I do think that, look, um, let, let's go backwards. Let's go backwards. And let me just say that if the best the Democratic Party can do is the American Rescue Plan, then, and, and, then, I, then, I, think, uh, then I, I think we're in, in, we're in for really, really tough times, truly tough times. Um, the test of a, of a, you know, the liberals, like the liberal media, you know, they're celebrating the American Rescue Plan. And look, it, it, it's needed. But the fact is they couldn't even get a $15 minimum wage included in that. Um, and, the, and they seem unwilling to go to bat, really go to bat for getting rid of the filibuster, passing a serious voting rights um, bill, a serious organizing bill. I mean, let's, I mean, the Democratic Party right now is is on the brink of returning to you know, the worst days of the 1970s. And let me just say that I was asked to speak on the 30s. Had I known, I could have easily talked more effectively, maybe in the context of these questions, if I had begun the story with the 1970s class war declared on labor and, and the fact that when they declared war on labor 
and the rights of workers and women in and 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 people of color in the 1970s what they were doing was they were declaring war on the social democratic legacy of the new deal okay let that be a testament to fdr okay and if you read the rights books you'll see they are going they have gone out of their way for 30 to 40 years to portray the 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 FDR years as an utter failure. And the fact is that that's a sign of just how much they feared it. What I'd recommend now is that um, the remaining uh, panelists speak in the same order with which we started. So Reed, Wayne, and then Gerald, and uh, please keep your uh, uh, concluding remarks to uh, two minutes or less each. Um, so with respect to the question about a hundred years old, uh, the, these politics being a hundred years old. Um, uh, so the science fiction author, author Philip K. Dick had this idea towards the end of his life that ended up kind of consuming him um, as a sort of paranoid fantasy um, that he was in fact a Christian living in the first century <laughs> AD um, in the aftermath of uh, Christ's crucifixion, and that all of the history that supposedly transpired afterwards um, up to his, his time in the 20th century was actually a hallucination that he was experiencing as this first century AD Christian. And I can't help but feel in a certain way that a similar idea um, is applicable politically to our, our time with respect to the period 1848 to 1917, so to speak, um, you know, maybe expanding that a little bit more. Um, there's a sense in which we are stuck in a moment that we can't resolve and everything that has happened subsequently hasn't really happened, but has sort of been a fant fantastic projection of what might have happened. Um, maybe that's a hopeful perspective or maybe it's a, a desperate um, or even psychotic one, but it certainly feels true to me when I read this this stuff from the old socialist party or from Marx or, or whatever, what have you. And it just feels so much more real to me than anything else I've ever read about politics. So I don't know, take that for what it is. Um, and I'll just also say, um, I'll, I'll, I'll just also say that, um, sorry, I'm trying to recall what the, uh, the, uh, the other question was. Um, with respect to, uh, uh, political independence. Um, for the old socialist movement, at least, the political independence of the working class was the sine qua non. Uh, it, there, was, there was nothing if there was not political independence. And I can't help but wonder what Eugene Debs, sitting in the Woodstock jail after the defeat of the Pullman strike, a labor leader, one of the best leaders the labor movement has ever had, undoubtedly, um, sitting in the Woodstock jail if Victor Berger hadn't been there to hand him a copy of Karl Kautsky's The Class Struggle. Would he, would he have just become a socialist spontaneously by reasoning what his experiences um, you know, had to offer him? Or did he need that intervention from an intellectual who had this crazy idea of the need for the workers to have an independent political representation and the whole historical reasoning behind that. Um, you know, we may not be in a place where we can have an independent socialist party at the moment, but the idea of an independent political expression of the working class and the struggle for socialism, I think is one that needs to not only be retained, um, it needs to be recovered from under a century of wreckage in which it's no longer able to be seen at all. Wayne? Yeah, we're, you know, when you're talking about history, it's it's remarkable how uh, we feel like we're constantly going in circles. Are we not uh, a situation now where the extent of union organization is, uh, if anything, is about lower than it was at the, at the before the 30s, and where uh, uh, women's rights to abortion are <laughs> under attack again, and the right of black people to vote? is directly attacked by a tsunami of uh, reactionary laws being raised by the Republicans. I mean, I can go on, uh, there's all sorts of things that, uh, in, nothing that's won is really won as long as we have the same system. And as soon as it has uh, hits a, a bump in the road, it's, it 
drives it back. And one of our two major political parties uh, has become a, a sort of a death cult of the right uh, with a fascist fringe, and the other one uh, capitulates to it and has been said can barely uh, reach up to, to the level of the New Deal, let alone, uh, well, what do we want? We want, the question is not just, is this a lesser evil? Yes, the Democrats are a lesser evil. Is it proposing an adequate program, a program that can deal with the crises of the environment and uh, the uh, global warming and uh, economic uh, collapse and decline of capitalism? The answer is no, it can't. It's like been said, you know, it's like saying, you know, like uh, they say, well, uh, is the proposals of, on the environment that are being raised by uh, the Democrats are the best that can be done considering the various limitations, Republicans and so forth, to which has been said, you know, mother nature doesn't care. The laws of physics do not care that the Democrats can't get past that they want to deal with the uh, uh, global warming, unlike the Republicans, but our various things can get in their way. N nature does not give them an extra credit for that. Either we deal with it in an adequate way or we don't. And capitalism can't because it has a drive to accumulate. Uh, let me say that whereas uh, Harvey says because of the crises, uh, that makes him want to be, be a reformist because this is what you got to do. Uh, similarly, somebody raised the question of, uh, well, should we have to give up the independent political action of the workers in order to get reforms? I, on the other hand, feel that because of the crises, are so great, therefore I'm a revolutionary. Therefore I think nothing but capitalist, revolution against capitalism in a state will do. And when say, well, we do need reforms, we do need change, we can't wait for them until the mass of people are in favor of revolution, which they certainly are not at this moment. That's for why I say yes, what we have to advocate is not uh, an improved democratic party nor new political parties uh, working inside the electoral system arranged by the state, but the mass independent action from below of masses of people of union drives and uh, here I'm agreeing with Harvey and uh, uh, independent demonstrations and civil disobedience and raising hell in every possible way by masses of people from below. And in that way, in that way, we, as in the, why in the 60s were we able to make such an effect on the government? They feared the growing radicalization of masses of young people and working people back in the 60s, and therefore they were prepared to step back and certain gains were won. And the same thing will be true now, even on the, even as, not, and we have to organize the left wing of that movement. We, the radicals in various united fronts, be, despite our various political differences, including particularly, I want to organize a, a libertarian revolutionary anarchist, a wing of it, but willing to work together with other radicals, anyone will work and go in my direction to fight against the capitalism and the Democratic Party and all the other minions of the uh, ruling class. Gerald. Okay. Uh, well, let me just. Uh, Amazon. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was thinking. I'm. Not. <laughs> you know, recently. The, uh, the DSA took a very militant stand, uh, the leadership of the DSA. So for instance, there was something called Bernie or Bus. And at the 2019 DSA conference, they actually voted that they would not support any other Democrat in the primary except for Bernie. And I thought that was very interesting. Well, what happened? I don't know if you guys noticed it, but there was something called the pledge that was circulated amongst the leadership of the DSA and, and members where people basically took a deeply hypocritical reactionary and contrary position from what they had taken earlier. So the majority of the DSA voted in its convention that we should not support anyone but Bernie. In reality, the pledge called for the claim there was an emergency, that Trump had to be uh, unseated at any cost, 
and therefore we have to vote against Trump is what they said. Now, everybody, we're all adults, knows that that was a call for the Democratic Party candidate, that is Sleepy Joe. This was a betrayal of their own program. And uh, tell you the truth, I can't say it enough. I don't want to sound negative, but betrayal is, I think, an accurate term. So the Red Republican Caucus is striving to strengthen the left wing of the DSA with our campaign for a politically independent workers party. Now, that's important to me. That's why I joined that caucus and that's why we're campaigning right now. But I do agree with Harvey on one thing for sure. And that is that the unions can, they should, and they will play a decisive role in the building of a genuine workers party. Otherwise it cannot exist. So right now though, what do we have? What is the reality? The unions must be built from the ground up because currently only 11% of the US workers are in the unions. So for instance, this Saturday coming, I'm slated to speak at a rally for the Amazon workers in the Bay Area. I personally have questions about that, but that's okay. Anything we can do to implant in the minds of our youth, union good, organizing unions better. But we do have to teach people about the degeneration of organizations, the nature of the trade union bureaucracy so that they can be fully prepared for this fight. Um, I'm speaking in fact, as a member of a group called the Labor Action Committee to free Mumia Abu Jamal. I just want to mention that unfortunately Mumia currently has COVID. He is very ill and is in the prison infirmary. Uh, anything that you can do to bring this unfortunate fact to your constituents is welcome. Okay. I, I just want to I just want to say thank you very much to Platypus for allowing us to have this discussion and I'm hoping that the people that are, you know, in our audience here got something out of it. Thank you. Thanks, Gerald, and thanks to all of our panelists. Um, thanks for a great discussion. And uh, this uh, uh, event will be placed on YouTube, uh, the uh, Platypus Affiliated Society YouTube channel. And you can keep track of Platypus and all of our activities at platypus1917.org. So good night, everyone. Thanks. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Good night to everyone. Thank you all.